consideration. The previous podcasts have dealt with the first two of the six key parts of a contract, offer and acceptance. In this and the next podcast, I consider the third point, consideration. In this podcast, I cover the basic rules on consideration, and in the next, the concept of promissory estoppel. The starting point for thinking about consideration is to remember that we are talking about the law of contract, the law of agreements, or of bargains and exchanges. An exchange would see promises flowing from both parties, from each to the other. This exchange of promises is the textbook definition of consideration, the leading authority is the case of Dunlop Pneumatic Tyre and Selfridge. This can be contrasted with the situation in which I promise to do something expecting nothing in return. Although it might be rude of me not to deliver on my promise, and there might be some form of societal expectation that I will do what I say I will do, if I am not receiving something in return, there is no exchange and thus no consideration for the purposes of the law of contract. You might look at it this way. A simple promise alone is outside the scope of contract law, but an exchange of promises is good consideration for a contract. There are four rules for the establishment of consideration, although, as usual, there are a number of exceptions. And the four basic rules are these. First, consideration must not be past consideration, in the sense of something already done or given. Second, consideration must flow from the party seeking to enforce the contract. Third, consideration must be sufficient, but need not be adequate. And fourthly, it must not be a duty already owed. Consideration must not be past consideration, and this is a relatively simple rule. Consideration must be something new, rather than something which has already been given or done. The authority Roscola and Thomas. Let's take a practical example. We meet on a train and your computer is not working. I help you out and make it work. You say thank you and promise to buy me a bottle of wine. If you do not give me the wine, can I sue you for breach of contract? No, for there is no contract. I have not given you any consideration in exchange for your promise to give me the wine. The help that I gave you was in the past, and so it is not good, fresh consideration. There is, however, an exception to this principle, and an act done before the giving of a promise to make payment, or to confer some other benefit, can sometimes be consideration for a promise, according to the court in Powon and Lao Yi Long. And while this has its limits, it is quite a large exception. The basis of the exception is the situation in which party A asks party B to do something, and while there is no express discussion of payment, there is an expectation that party A will pay party B in some way. Party B does what is asked of it, and party A subsequently expressly promises to pay, but fails to do so. Can party B enforce party A's promise to pay? According to the general rule, the answer would be no. Party B brings no consideration, as it has already done the work in question, before party A makes the promise. However, in Powon and Li Yi Long, the courts have held that where a party does something at the request of another party, and the other party subsequently promises to pay, provided there was an understanding that the act was to be remunerated, and that the re remuneration would have been enforceable if agreed in advance, the promisor is bound contractually by his promise. If party A does something without being asked, it would fall outside the exception. If the context is a social one rather than a business one, it may be hard to establish that there was an understanding that the act would be remunerated. If I help fix your computer, for example, am I just doing something helpful for a fellow traveller with no expectation of remuneration? Would the situation be different if, instead of being on a train, you walked into my computer repair shop, for example? And, without saying anything, I walked over and fixed the problem. In a business context, it is perhaps more likely than not that there is an expectation of a remuneration, but the onus would still be on the party claiming that what looks like past consideration should be treated as good consideration 
to prove that there was such an understanding. That is the first rule, that consideration must not be past consideration, and the exception to the rule, which may arise in business situations where one party does something at the request of the other party. The second rule is that consideration must flow from the party seeking to enforce the contract. To put it another way, consideration must have moved from the claimant to the defendant, and the cases I suggest that you read are Price and Easton and Tweddle and Atkinson. The third rule is that consideration does not have to be adequate, but it must be sufficient. This can be quite a confusing concept to understand, because the words adequate and sufficient are often used interchangeably, but in the context of consideration they have quite specific meanings. Perhaps an easier way of paraphrasing this rule is that some consideration must flow from one party to the other, and it must have some value attached to it. But the value of the consideration going from one party to the other does not need to be equal to the consideration flowing in the other direction. The basis of this is the idea of freedom of contract. Parties with equal bargaining power should have freedom to enter into a contract on whatever terms they see fit, even if those terms do not appear to be equally balanced. If I want to sell you my computer for £5, I should be able to enter into that agreement for you, even if the computer is worth more than £5. Take a look at the case of Chapel and Nestlé. It is an interesting case on this point, since the court was not in agreement as to what the correct position should be. The approaches of the dissenting judges are worth reading. The case fundamentally turned on whether the wrappers of three chocolate bars could be considered consideration for the purposes of a contract. The defendant threw the wrappers away immediately on receipt, and so one might argue that they clearly had no value at all. Others argue that they did have value. They acted as evidence that the sender had purchased three bars of the defendant's chocolate, which, given that the overall exercise at issue in the case was to increase the sales of the defendant's chocolates, seems a reasonable enough proposition that they were good consideration. Consideration does not have to be physical, and a promise not to enforce a legal right is likely to be sufficient consideration in the case of Kalisher. However, a promise to stop frivolous litigation, where the promisor knows that the litigation is frivolous, is unlikely to be sufficient consideration, the case of Wade and Simeon. You may get a sense from the cases that courts can sometimes seem as if they are trying hard to find consideration where none obviously exists, that they are trying to find a basis to hold that a contract is enforceable for a public policy reason, notwithstanding a lack of obviousness that the formalities of the law of contract have been met. As such, if you are trying to enforce a contract which you think should stand on a public policy basis, a lack of obvious consideration may not be a complete stumbling block if you find something, perhaps anything, to which you could point and say, this is an exchange of value. The fourth requirement is that consideration cannot be a duty already owed. I've already discussed that past consideration is not good consideration and that one cannot rely on something which has been done in the past as consideration for a future promise. This is slightly different. What of the situation in which I have already made a promise to do something, but I have not yet done it? Can I promise again to do that thing as consideration for another contract? The general principle is that, no, a promise to perform something in respect of which a duty is already owed is not good consideration, as the recipient of such a promise gets nothing which he does not already have, and so accrues no benefit. The textbook case on this principle is that of Stilke and Myrick, although there are two reports of the case, and they do not quite agree on what basis the case was decided. The facts of the case were that sailors had agreed to sail a ship from A to B and back again. On arrival at B, two of the sailors ran away, and the captain of the ship promised to split the two deserting sailors' wages among the remaining crew if they agreed to sail the ship back to A without getting two more crew members. On arrival back at A, the captain refused to pay the extra money. 
In one of the reports, the court's basis for rejecting the crew member's claim was that there was no new consideration. The crew member already owed a duty to sail the ship back, and this is exactly what he did. The second report, perhaps a less authoritative one, was that as a matter of public policy, the claim should be rejected. If sailors learned that they could simply demand more money to do something which they had already agreed to do, it would harm the seafaring industry. Contrast this case of Stilken Myrick with that of Hartley and Ponsonby. A similar case on the one hand, in that it dealt with deserting sailors. However, rather than just two sailors deserting, in the Hartley and Ponsonby case, almost half the crew deserted, and, of the remainder, the majority were not experienced sailors. The captain promised to pay the remaining crew an extra sum, and, on arrival, refused to make good his promise. In this case, the claim for extra wages succeeded, on the basis that the claimants had gone above and beyond their original promise. Working a ship with an insufficient crew was dangerous, and in agreeing to undertake this additional work, the crew had formed a new bargain. Both of these cases can be seen as having been judged on the basis of duties owed, and whether new duties were, in fact, undertaken by the claimants. This approach can be contrasted with that of a more recent case, Williams and Rofi, in which the focus was less on the duty owed, but on whether the defendant accrued a new benefit which could be treated as consideration. The case deals with a carpenter who had agreed to do some carpentry work. The carpenter's client had a deadline and was concerned that the carpenter, who was not progressing the work quickly enough, was not going to meet the deadline. So the client offered the carpenter more money to get the job done. Not to do any more work than had already been agreed, but to get the job done. The client then refused to pay the extra sum, claiming that there was no consideration. The carpenter's duty was to do the work under the original agreement, and they had taken on no new duty for the extra money. If you applied the principle of Stilcom Myrick strictly, the outcome would be that there was no consideration from the carpenter, as they were simply doing something which they were already obliged to do. However, in Williams and Rofi, the court looked at the situation from the other side, and considered that the defendant, the client, had gained a benefit from the New Deal, on the basis that work would be done on time, and they would not be penalised for missing the deadline. Since this had been in jeopardy, removal of that jeopardy and the penalty associated with it was good consideration. Although the court opined that Williams and Rofi merely refines Stilken Myrick rather than overruling it, it is hard to find a clear reason to reconcile the two decisions. Perhaps, in the case of Stilk, the harm which would be suffered by upholding the claim, the damage to the seafaring industry if sailors could demand more money halfway around the world, was far worse than in the situation here. But that doesn't feel right. If a builder knows that he or she can get most of the way through a job, then demand more money simply to finish the job they'd already agreed to do, that doesn't feel a good conclusion from a public policy perspective either. Conversely, perhaps it is a good decision on the basis of freedom to contract. The client could have recourse to their legal rights and sued the carpenter for breach of contract. But this could have been a drawn-out process with no guarantee of success, or no guarantee that the carpenter had the money to pay damages, and so the client made a commercial decision as to how to resolve the problem. If they considered that it was commercially pragmatic to pay more to get the same job done, should the court intervene in the party's freedom to contract to that extent? A similar approach has been taken with a recent case to do with a duty owed to a third party, in the case the Eurymedon. In that case, A owed a contractual duty to B. C entered into a contract with A, under which A was required to perform its duty to B. Under the Stilken Myrick principle, as A already owed a duty to B, no fresh consideration would be found to have flowed from A to C, and so there would be no enforceable contract. However, the court found that, in entering into the contract, C had acquired a benefit, a right to sue A if A did not perform its duty to B. And this accrual of the right to enforce was, in itself, good consideration.
To sum up, one of the six key parts of a contract is consideration, which can be seen as the exchange of promises between the parties. And there are four basic rules. One, consideration must not be past consideration. Two, consideration must flow from the party seeking to enforce the contract. Three, consideration does not have to be adequate, but it must be sufficient. Four, consideration cannot be a duty already owed. And while there are still these four basic rules, the courts have not been shy to move away from them, and they would appear to be less strict today than they have in the past. In particular, where relationships between parties are broadly equivalent, recently courts appear to have been minded more towards the notion of freedom to contract, and of enforcing agreements between parties which were entered into freely, even if they appear to be unconventional in their approach to consideration. In the next podcast, I will discuss the concept of promissory estoppel and its application to the principle of consideration.